CKNW's Chief Executive Series is presented by Fortis BC, energy solutions for every customer. Good afternoon and welcome to the BD School of Business and welcome to the first in our CEO series. With me today we have John Montalbano, President of RBC Asset Management. John, thank you so much for being here. It's the least I can do to get rid of those shameful commercials that you've got on featuring me. <laughs> shameful? Oh, yeah, they're embarrassing. <laughs> I don't think so. I think so people are are gonna, there's a very good reason why we're running those. I think people are going to find that out today. Uh, let people know, what is it exactly? How would you describe your job? What do you do? Well, I, I oversee an organization of 1,400 people that manages now about $345 billion of assets under management, which means we're managing people's money all around the world. Um, and we manage money for individuals, uh, people who have as little as $5,000 to save to uh, large endowments who have monies in the billions. And uh, we have offices in uh, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, New York, Boston, London, and, um, and we're also establishing uh, offices in Zurich and in Japan and a whole host of other places. We have a, uh, also quite a large office in Hong Kong as well. So no pressure? None whatsoever. No, none at all. What time does your day start? Uh, it typically starts, you know, my alarm clock goes off around 5.30, be somewhere between 5 and 5.30. Uh, earlier, um, if I have a conference call that starts at 4 or 5, um, I'm often on a plane. So there's, as, as you can imagine, when you have multiple time zones like that, there's no such thing as a regular work hour. And so you just have to roll with it. And, and, uh, and Any such thing as a regular work day? Not really, is the truth. Uh, well, it's one of the great things about the business I'm in is that, you know, we really are dealing with information and current events, and uh, you're trying to ultimately invest around those current events. And, and current events don't wait for you wait for you to wake up. Uh, you've got to sort of adapt to what's happening in the moment. And uh, so, from that perspective, uh, there's no such thing as a regular day, but there's a lot of great days. You also have a young family. Mm -hmm. Married, two small children, under the age of 10. How do you balance that? I got uh, really incredible support from my wife. <laughs> got to get that out of the way. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't forget the most important person in my life. Um, and so uh, you really do need a lot of support. And, um, and so there's no question that um, you know, the challenges of this role, when you choose leadership, you're not only choosing it for yourself, you're actually choosing it for your family. And uh, so from that perspective, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, prior to us getting married because I was sort of rolling into the role as this was happening to talk about what life would be like, especially with children. And uh, so we, uh, we kind of knew what the rules of engagement would be for both of us as we w sort of went into this. And, and, um, and I'm very fortunate that we've been both able to live up to our, our, our pledge to one another. So. But even with your employees, you do stress family time, family life, having a work-life balance. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is something that I feel very strongly about. And uh, so I have employees in this audience, so they'll call me on my, my comments today if I'm not saying the, uh, the, the truthful facts. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about what work-life balance looks like. And I, I think there's a myth that somehow you'll find the perfect middle spot. It's really about choices. And, and our duty as an employer is to make sure that we provide um, all of our employees, whether they're the receptionist right through to my role ultimately, that throughout the continuum of your career, you're going to have support to manage your work life as well as your home life. And we also will throw one more thing in there. Can we help somebody get involved in the community as well? And so we try to shave off some time within the, the working hours itself or even days uh, to make sure that we're providing opportunity for our people to get into the community. So when we think about work-life balance, it's work, it's home, it's community. It's those three things that we really strive for as an organization. You said something really interesting. You said, when I chose leadership. Do you think that is what an employee does at some point in your career? Do you choose that you want to take on a leadership role? Uh, you know, it's, I'd say the answer is yes and no. Ultimately, someone has to choose you. Um, so through your efforts, and if it's a meritocracy and you've had an honest effort and, and you've been rewarded for success, opportunities will come. Ultimately, it's up for the individual to choose to take that opportunity or wait for the next one or choose no opportunity at all. Um, but I do think that once you step into a role of leadership, um, you're then choosing to... Um, take on the privilege of leadership and all the responsibilities that go with it. And uh, so it is a choice. And once that choice is made, um, I, I think you're all in. You've got to do a good job because, as we say, in our firm, there's 1,400 families that are dependent on you being a good leader. And uh, we have multiple leaders within our organization, so that saying goes for all of them. And, uh, Who taught you that? I mean, did you learn that along the way, or did, did somebody point you out? Did somebody mentor you? Who it's an interesting question because as I'm mentoring students now and, and I go to enough forums with, um, with other professionals, I, I, every time I hear that question I recognize 
how fortunate I've really been. Um, you know, many people will, will strive for one great mentor in their lives, and I've actually had about a half a dozen. Um, I've had great role models. I do distinguish between role models and, and mentors. And so role models are people you wish to either emulate or not. Um, so my mom and dad, who uh, immigrated from Italy with nothing, didn't speak the language, um, were incredibly hardworking. My dad was a miner, then a janitor. My mom was a short order cook at the bay when they had the coffee mug. And I used to see them leave early, come late, um, just completely fatigued. And uh, that was something I really wanted to emulate, just sort of in their, in their honor, is that I've got to work hard, otherwise I'm not respecting my parents. When it comes to mentorship, these are people who will guide you through your career. And, um, you know, I've been very, very fortunate to have, um, uh, you know, a family doctor. I was chronically ill as a kid, so my family doctor became a pretty good friend. <laughs> and so, and uh, he talked me out of becoming a doctor. Um, <laughs> I had a... I had wow, a really good friend. Uh, yeah, a really okay. good friend. Yeah. My soccer coach, Mike Dumoulin, who had a company by the name of Dumoulin in Black, and man, I still admire to this day. Um, I admired Mike because I grew up in East Vancouver, but I played soccer on the west side. And uh, so Mike was actually the first person that I came in contact with that was an actual professional outside of the doctor that I normally would visit once a week to get my allergy shots. And Mike uh, was somebody I looked up to, and I was just approaching university, and I said, Mike, I want to be a lawyer. And he goes, no, you don't. <laughs> and so there goes law. And so, there goes and so, medicine, there goes, goes yeah, law. Well, you know, yeah, if you grow up in an Italian family, your parents are, are asking you to become a doctor, a teacher, a lawyer, an accountant. In my case, they really wanted me to be a priest. And so <laughs> all five were wiped out in a hurry. And, um, and so I had great mentors as I went through university. Milt Wong, um, a, cl a classic uh, business leader in Vancouver, but not only a successful business person, but a an amazing philanthropist in the community. Uh, Art Phillips, who was the mayor of Vancouver at one time, and then the founder, Art and I shared, shared an office for about 15 years. Uh, we, we literally sat across from each other for 15 years. And uh, prime ministers, premiers, mayors would walk into the office. I would get up to leave, and Art would say, sit back down, and uh, you're part of this conversation. And at 22, 23, you can imagine how impressionable that was. No kidding. Um, it was quite an amazing experience, really. And, and it goes on and on. So I've had Bob Hager, uh, the, one of the founders of the firm, again, uh, someone that um, was a real moral compass of our firm. And it just taught you that you can win and be a good person. And so that... That really taught me a lot, to be honest, and, and so I've been blessed. I've got, like I said, I can go on for about two, two or three more people, but they had a massive impact. Dick Bradshaw is the last one I would mention. He's the one who really took me under his wing. Dick was uh, an individual, is, and thank God he's still around. He's still my mentor. He's in his 70s now. And um, he was tough as nails, and he was sort of the professional dad I never had. And so he would sit down and, and walk through what I did right, what I did wrong, where I could improve, challenge me. And, um, and also ultimately uh, became my sponsor. So I really, when I think of the audience today being students, uh, I really think there's three, three types of people. Uh, one is the role models. They're good role models and there's bad role models. Um, there's mentors. If you can get a, at least one great mentor, it'll have a profound effect on your career. And then there's sponsors. Through great effort, success, a strong moral compass, or you know, a, a great personal integrity, people will want to sponsor you and uh, they'll step up and swing for you when opportunities arise. So that's how I think about that question, Sam. So. All right, well, you said something other really interesting there. You could also win and be a good person, and I'm not sure they teach you that in, in business school. That seems like a pretty valuable lesson. <laughs> it is, and I actually, I'm actually quite uh, encouraged because many business schools now are spending a lot of time on ethics, and I think that is critically important. All right, we're going to talk more about that when we come back. Whether building a deck, installing a fence, or landscaping, remember to call BC One Call before starting any digging project. Don't be on the hook for costly repairs or risk your safety. Welcome back. We are at the SFU BD School of Management for our CEO series, and with me is John Montalbano, the president of RBC Asset Management. John, thank you again for being here today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. You were talking about ethics in business and that is so important I mean I'm looking at your career here and you went from 20 years after joining the firm in 1987 to being the president that is quite a climb how do you do that and still keep all of those things in mind that you were talking about <clears throat> well the questions about ethics I mean first and foremost um, you, you have to have good people that you're following and um, our firm obsessed 
about ethics. And the reason being is, you know, being in Vancouver, especially in the, in the 60s and 70s when the business formed, Vancouver had quite a different reputation when it came to investment management. The Vancouver Stock Exchange was not considered the most reputable place to make one's money. And so here you have this incredibly reputable firm in Phillips Hager North, and uh, they fought tooth and nail uh, to always uh, not fall into the cap of their Vancouver-based investment firm. And uh, so for the longest time, um, they really worked hard to ensure that we were different, we were seen as different, we were very active in the community, and that we were sincerely active in the community, not for marketing reasons, but the people who gravitated to this firm were people who wanted to do it the right way um, and, and do it the long way, if you will, no shortcuts, and also make sure that whatever they took from the community, they gave back in multiples. And so that, that really becomes how um, you get trained through the firm. And so the culture of, of ethics, uh, integrity, collegiality, uh, candidness is something that just gets drilled into your blood. And over 20 years, um, you wake up and you say, you know, I, I'm, it. I'm, I'm now re representing um, what once was representative to me. And, and, and so from that perspective, uh, we spend a lot of time on culture of integrity and, uh, and make sure that the people that we hire and we keep are the ones that feel like they can do it the hard way which means uh, sometimes you just can't cut that corner if it's going to compromise a client's experience. Isn't that hard to get that message out, though, to younger employees, perhaps, who do want to climb up that ladder? And for them, it may seem like, boy, this, if I do this, my career is going to be compromised. Like, how do you get that message across to them? Well, first of all, we hire very good people. That we'll, We spend a lot of time on the hiring process to make sure that the people we do hire are comfortable with working hard. Um, they have a, a, an experience quotient, whether they're incoming professionals or coming out of university, that shows that there was nothing easy in their life, no matter how easy their life would have been perceived. We could have come from the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks, but we're looking for people who, who recognize um, that they have something to give and, uh, and they're going to give it. And so we spend a lot of time on hiring to make sure we get the people who are going to be consistent with our culture. And then we work with them. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about mentorship, and, and we have a very engaged, um, I'd say, youthful core. And um, one of the things that I'm most encouraged about uh, with this graduating class in particular, but um, all of our youth right now that we have in our firm, and I guess it's the millennials, I've never seen a, a, a more engaged group of individuals um, in my 28-year career um, of managing people than I am seeing now. Like Today's youth really care um, about society, they, they really care about sustainability, they care about ethics, they care about contributing to the world, and man, it's been a long time since I've seen that. And so I'm actually very, very, very hopeful uh, that the future looks incredibly uh, great for our communities as a result of the students that, that I'm seeing firsthand. What do you look for in employees? So somebody brings a resume to you, they want to apply for a job with you, they are students here. What assets do you check off on that list? What are you looking for? Well, we recognize that getting experience in our industry is very difficult. And, um, and so we, we really are looking for, first and foremost, are, uh, is the student um, or any potential hire, you know, say a younger hire, do they have a lot of potential? And Because uh, we can bring that out if we're successful in, in, in our stewardship of, of, of our individual talent. And so what we're looking for is obviously marks are important, but um, how did they get their marks? So when we sit down and we, and we ask them questions, really we're not looking for the right answer. Uh, we're, we're looking to the path to the answer. How did they get there? And what was their deductive logic? Were they reasoned in terms of getting there? And even if they got to the wrong place because there was probably some binary path that they went down that may have been the wrong answer, it was really how they got to that crossroads before they actually had to make a, a decision. So we spent a lot of time, uh, death by a thousand cuts, we, every inter interview, interviewee has about 11 interviews, 10 interviews, and so they will meet virtually for every, every employee? Pretty much. Um, even, even for our interns, they'll go through you know, probably a half dozen interviews, and then our professionals will go through about 11. Wow. Yeah. Is that standard, would you say, for your industry, or is that I just your not. standard? I hope not, because it's, <laughs> it's, because it's our competitive advantage, to be honest. Um, I, you know, our turnover is less than 4%, and so from, from our overall staff, and so that's almost unheard of in the industry. And I think it's because we spend a lot of time um, on our intake, and so that, that becomes very important. You also, clearly for you, it's very important to continue education. I mean, that's something you have done over and over and over again throughout your career. Why is that so important? I, I think that you can't die on the vine intellectually. And so, and the world is, um, is always changing, so you've got to change with it. And uh, the world's always building on, on its past, and so you have to do the same. And, 
And so I spend a lot of time, I mean, I fly a lot. And so um, I don't like flying, I don't enjoy it, but the one thing I do enjoy about flying is that I have a stack of journals um, that are on the industry or on global events that could impact investment outcomes. And I'll spend the next four or five hours just reading those materials, getting caught up on current events that could have an impact on our clients' outcomes. And so from that perspective, that's important. I also look at academic research in terms of what they're discovering about what we do. Um, academics do an exceedingly good job of telling you what you do wrong. And so, so from that perspective, I, I, I do spend a lot of time identifying the things that we do in our business and how can we improve them or if they're even valid any longer based on uh, how the world has evolved. It, it sounds like what is key to you, though, is that you can really never know too much. No, absolutely not. I, I mean, I will say that that's an interesting statement. Um, I think it's very important to, to know as much as you can and feed your curiosity and, and your intellect. Um, it's important not to think that you know more than other people. And, um, and so from that perspective, uh, the smartest person in the room is often not the most effective person in the room. So we're looking for the most engaged person, the person who's up to date and can make good decisions. Um, and so it, you know, I saw you sort well, of twitch on that what, movement. Yeah, what you mean by who, well, who is the, what would you say makes the most effective person in the room? The most effective person in the room are clear thinkers, um, people who understand that mistakes will happen. Um, that they're willing to acknowledge mistakes and learn from mistakes. And uh, often the smartest people in the room are the ones that have never made a mistake in their lives. And so when a mistake happens, they're kind of pointing the other way because it's never been them. So from that perspective, um, you know, I, I, we really make sure that people are exceedingly well-informed, well-educated, and well-supported. So if mistakes happen, they know it's okay. You know, and, and uh, one of the most social events at our firm is when a mistake happens and it costs our client money. We bring everybody in a room and we say, okay, what happened? Okay, let's make the client whole. And now let's learn from the mistakes. And everyone comes together and it's almost a badge of honor that we're in this room admitting that we made a mistake. And we're going to walk through it and make sure the mistake doesn't happen again for others that come behind us uh, in the same role. And so creating a culture where you can make decisions because you're informed um, knowing that uh, there's no such thing as perfect information or even a perfect decision. Mistakes will happen, so how do we support that and make sure that we have an honest and candid environment around us so that we can learn from those mistakes. And sometimes mistakes are frankly celebrated because they make you better. That's a great sort of thing to have around in the company, in the business. Does that translate to, to your customers, to your clients as well? Do you have to let them know this is our philosophy? Absolutely. I got a letter uh, just last week from a client who was somewhat disappointed about something that we had done. And, and frankly, it was something we needed to do. And, and we sent out a letter. And the, and the comment in the letter was, you know, I don't even know why you sent this letter out because you're not asking for our approval. And, and so... And, uh, and then he sent the little pithy quote at the bottom saying, I'm sure as CEO, you're not going to respond to this because you're too busy, right? So, so I responded. And so, <laughs> and so from that perspective, I said, look, we could have done one of two things. We could have swept this under the carpet, and you probably would never have noticed that we had done this. And then five years from now, you'll wake up angry that you, will never, you weren't informed. I'd rather you be angry now, the moment it's happening, so we can talk about it, than five years from now and you telling me that I didn't tell you what you needed to know. And so I would always um, err on the side of being candid and transparent, however uncomfortable that is. That's, I think that's part of leadership. Well, lots of business and life lessons that we are learning today from John Montalbano from RBC Asset Management. We'll have more of our conversation with him, with the CEO series, when we come back. Good afternoon and welcome to the Beatty School of Business. It is the CEO series and our guest today is John Montalbano from RBC Asset Management. And you carved out the time for us today, which I am amazed when I look at your schedule. How and how do you cram so much in a day? Um, you, you make it happen is the truth. Um, there, there's, <laughs> there's reasons to be distracted and, and uh, if you do what you love, um, then you find things, you find time to do the things that you love. And, um, I, and there's things I don't love but are important and you have to make, those, uh, you have to make time for those as well. But I, I'm very fortunate. Um, I mentioned earlier in the program that I've got a very supportive family. Um, and, uh, and so from that perspective, the quid pro quo was, you know, I, I really want to do this role. I love, I love my firm. I love my people. I love our clients. And so 
Um, my my uh, response back to my wife is, if this is fine, that we can do this. Um, you know, I will give up my mountain biking, my snowboarding, hanging out with the guys for a beer after work. <laughs> I'm coming home. I'll, I'll take care of the kids. I'll coach the kids and uh, when I'm in town. So, um, and so that's what you do is you have to make some choices in life. And, and uh, right now, at this point in my life, um, I feel I can have the most contribution to our clients, to our people, to my family and to the community and, and the, the other selfish stuff, uh, t to lose that 30 pounds I've gained because of that, <laughs> that will be retirement. And so, uh, so that, 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 that's, how, that's how you do it. All right, well, let's talk about the corporate ladder because a lot of people want advice, how to climb it, how to get to essentially where you have gotten. And for you, it was 20 years from the time that you joined the firm to the time that you got to the top of it. Uh, let's start when you first started out there. Were you aware that you wanted to go as high as you possibly could, or was that something that became organic? It was organic. Um, you, you know, it, in truth, all through my youth, um, I found myself as the captain of the soccer team and, and all sorts of stuff. And, and um, so leadership was somewhat, somewhat natural for me. Um, and very early on in my, in my tenure with the firm, uh, it was Peter Malcolm, whose office was sort of three, four doors down from where I, uh, I, I was doing my job with art. He coined a phrase pretty early, and he said, don't worry about it, because Montabano will. And, uh, <laughs> and so I became very engaged in my organization. And, and this, is, this would be a piece of advice I would give to any um, young, ambitious individual, is to, when you take a job, just don't take a job. Um, Take responsibility for the whole organization. Uh, assume you're now the owner and, and be engaged with the corporate mission. And if you have a tough time believing in the corporate mission, you're probably not well placed because you'll never, you'll never succeed in my mind or self-actualize, if you will, in an organization that you don't believe in. And so I stepped into an organization that I just fundamentally believed in. For all the stuff that was going on, um, slamming the financial industry and, and, the, and uh, money managers and bankers and so on and so forth, I found my own piece of little heaven uh, with a group of individuals that had a very strong moral compass, um, wanted to do what was right for the client. Um, it was a, a heck of a fun job. We were very aspirational. And you sat back and said, you know, this is great. I had an offer to go to Goldman Sachs when I graduated. And uh, so my choice was Goldman Sachs in New York or Philip Sager North in Vancouver. And people thought I was absolutely nuts to have assumed uh, the job in Vancouver rather than go to New York. And for 20 years, I thought I was absolutely nuts for doing the same thing. <laughs> and, uh, but I can say I never regretted my choice um, because I felt that for me uh, and, and where I was in my life and my, my, my moral sort of compass, I was surrounded by people that I could relate to and wanted to emulate. And so from that perspective, 20 years is a blur. It sounds like a long time, but it, it was just yesterday that you know I was um, talking stocks with Art Phillips and, and thinking like I've died and gone to heaven. This is I couldn't think of a better place. Is it important for somebody who is starting out then to ask themselves that question: What do I want from this? What do I want from this company? How far do I want to go? Where do I see myself? I don't think you could have framed it any better. Yeah, those are, I think those are the important questions to ask. Is that you know, let's be realistic. When you graduate, you just want a job. You've got to pay off your student loans. You want to tell someone you're employed. You don't want to be that person that doesn't have a job, right? <laughs> and so I've been there. I get it. And, uh, and I see it all the time because I still interview students. Um, and and, and uh, so from that perspective, um, you just want to get your foot in the door. And, then, and so the question then is, now that I've got my foot in the door, where do I go from here? Like, what am I going to do with this? How can I do anything with this? And sometimes you just need some time and money to, to pay off your bills and allow yourself some time to think and, and, um, and, and take inventory of what this job will do for you. And, and can you use this role to springboard into something else? And, um, and so I, I never um, suggest to people, like, just get a job and be happy that you're in. Uh, be happy that you're in, but be unhappy with where you're at. And, uh, and it's through hard work um, and effort behaving in a manner that's consistent with whatever the corporate mission is, showing your superiors that you get it, you know why the business exists, you know what the definition of excellence is for that firm, for that industry, and you're, and you're willing to contribute to that excellence. And that's my advice often when, when, um, when people come in in their first week of the job and say, you know, now that I'm here, like, what do you suggest? And on top of that, I say don't, don't ever compromise your integrity. Um, and, um, and so from that perspective, a lot of people, as they're trying to choose your path of, of, of an upward climb, um, I always say make sure that when you look back, there's no roadkill. 
that you haven't done it at someone else's expense. Um, and that's, I think those, those are some of the things that we talked about. How do you make sure that you get noticed, you get the recognition? You know, I'm sure it is a competitive business. Every business is. People want to make sure that their boss recognizes them for the hard work that they are doing. And as, as a manager of people, I'm sure you always have people, you know, somehow wanting to get your attention and recognition for what they did. But if you're the employee, how do you find the right way to communicate that to your boss that you are worth noticing? You know, there's a couple of things you do. First of all, do your job really, really well. Um, and uh, when I got into Philip Sager and North, I did some lousy jobs. And, um, and, you know, I was the first student they had hi ever hired. And so they really didn't know what to do with me once I got there. So I, I did some more. I even did the office move on a Saturday and a Sunday because none of the, the partners wanted to do it. So they threw, threw me keys saying, we're going from the 17th floor to the 20th floor. There's 5,000 square feet of, of furniture being moved. Where we'll see you on Monday. <laughs> I was like, what? That's not what I went to school for. And, uh, and so I was the best office mover that weekend the earth had ever seen, right? <laughs> Complete with the pens in the right spots. And, and there was no computers back then, believe it or not. So I just had to make sure that all their tabletops were cleaned and everything was set up. And, and, um, and so when they came back on Monday, they just said, wow, like, who did this? And it was the kid that we hired down the, the hallway. Well, he needs a raise. <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so that's kind of, literally, that's what happened. And so, uh, so that's number one is know what you were hired for. Uh, a lot of people, once they get their job, they do their job. They're trained, then they do it. But then they never stop and ask, why am I doing this? And why is this job important? And so from my perspective, the people that actually get noticed are the ones that sit there and say, well, thank you very much for the job. Why is this job important? Now that I'm here, um, can you tell me what is the definition of success in this role? And you'd be shocked at how many people don't do that. Um, they do their job really well, but they've never connected the dot of that role to the next role and how that next role then ultimately lands into the client experience. And so what we find is the students that come in, or even employees that we hire from other firms come in, the ones that are really curious about how does this all fit and why are we doing it this way? We can do it a better way uh, once they figure out the bigger picture. Those are the ones that really accelerate. And, they, and it's interesting, the people who do it really early on in their career, the people that end up doing it through their 50s, they just are always curious about how we can do something better. And, um, and so from that perspective, I think that's one of the most important pieces of advice I can give people is understand the context of that role and what makes that role successful. Convey that you know that that is the case, that you know, this role will be successful in the following conditions. And the quid pro quo is once I get there, I, I would like another opportunity. I think I've earned it. John Montalbano is our guest from RBC Asset Management. We are continuing to touch on what makes a person successful in business. We'll have more when we come back. We are at the SFU School of Business, and we are talking with John Montalbano from RBC Asset Management for our CEO series. And thank you again for making time for us to do this today. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. I see a lot of people out there taking notes because they know that you're giving them some very, very valuable advice. Who gave this advice to you? Um, mentors. And um, yeah, I've come back to how um, I've been very blessed with having great mentors in my life. And... Um, and so th through the course of that, you, you meet people and you see why they're very successful. And all of them, in my mind, had a number of characteristics that were quite common. So I mentioned earlier Milt Wong, Art Phillips, uh, Dick Bradshaw, Bob Hager, um, four people who are incredibly instrumental in my life. And um, all of them had incredible moral integrity. Uh, they, they spent a lot of time talking about the good in people and, and how one can be a good person and be successful in business. And so a lot of discussions... Um, it, through the course of my career with those individuals on exactly that. Um, the importance of curiosity. If anyone had met uh, Art Phillips or Milt and Bob when they were both, all three of them were alive, the one thing you would do when, you, when you're driving back or walking back to your office is they're among the most curious people I've ever met in my life. Not curious from strange, <laughs> but curious that they, they're asking a lot of questions that they actually want to seek answers to. And, um, and it's that that prolific sense of curiosity that really made them so special. And then once they identified what the issue was, they tried to figure out whether they could, in their own little way, solve for it. And, and so from my perspective, um, 
you know, I, I think one of the most important characteristics of any, any individual success in, in the business world is, is feeding your curiosity, being curious. And uh, so from that perspective, I'd say that's where I learned um, you know, some of my corporate behaviors. You've also been a real champion of diversity in the workplace, in particular making sure there are more women in the workplace moving up that ladder just like everybody else. Why is that so important to you? A number of different reasons, um, and in fact, I would go one step further and say visible minorities as well. So, you know, it was interesting. My, my mom and dad, as I said earlier, they, they immigrated from Italy in, in, in the 1950s, and my dad uh, always told me, you know, one day, somewhere, somehow, someone's going to pull the immigrant card on you. And actually, it never happened until one day. <laughs> and, uh, and so what, what it was was... Uh, I went to get my first loan. I had been asked to become a partner at Phillips Hager North. And, um, and so after a big celebration that I had been asked to be partner and I accepted, I went to the bank um, of, uh, of, of PHNN's the banker for 30 years. And I said, I'm becoming a partner and I need a loan. And a uh, big smile on my face. I thought the money was just going to go ka-ching, come out my head, just to get my hat out. and It was going to come. And, uh, and, and, and the bank manager who had been managing this, this, this firm for about 15 years, um, said, well, this is a very interesting case. And I said, well, what's so interesting about it? You've, you've got our financials for 30 years. You've bankrolled every single partner. Um, where's the money? And, and uh, he said, well, let me, let me uh, walk you through this. And he goes, Phillips, Hager, North, Slater, Brooks Hill, Motter's Head, McGill, he goes, Montalbano, what doesn't belong? And I said, you're kidding me. And, um, and so, he did that, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, and Dick was in the room. And so, and so at that point, I just sat back and said, wow, you know, uh, my dad was right. <laughs> and, uh, and so I went back to the office and, uh, and relayed the story. And, and, um, and so the people I just rambled off, Slater, McGill, Bradshaw, Brooks Hill, Motters said, were so angry, so, so angry. The very people that were held up against me were the very people that fought for me uh, and said, this is unacceptable. And they, they, they moved the banking relationship uh, just like that. And they said, you know what? Um, yeah. I still get tingles in my, in my spine when I hear it because they felt that it was everything that was wrong in business. And so, um, so that's a very personal story um, for sure. Um, other, other reasons, um, you know, when the Royal Bank acquired uh, Philip Sager North, one thing they do exceedingly well, uh, we did move our business to the Royal Bank, actually, um, so it's somewhat coincidental that they acquired us, but, uh, but when, when the Royal Bank um, uh, acquired Philip Sager North and threw me the keys to the combined business, the one thing that, they, that I would argue they do exceedingly well is, is measure the success of their diversity programs. And in the last three or four years, there was a heightened priority on making sure that we do all that we can do for women and, and people of visible minorities. And so being who I am, uh, I did as much research on the subject as I could. I didn't want to tick boxes. I just felt that that's a fake endeavor. And so I did not want to be a, a box ticker. And so I started to do as much research as possible. And what I discovered was there was a lot of research saying that there was a problem and no solutions. And in fact, the solutions that came were people like Sandberg's book, people who are in industry, but there was no academic research saying, like, how do we change the institutional norms of a business so that a true meritocracy exists for all? And so that the very best are coming up because we've removed all of the barriers. And so I got very frustrated uh, with everything I read. And, um, and I guess uh, I just said, look, it's, it's one thing to be frustrated and do nothing, or you can do something. And, and so Dana and I decided that um, we would fund a professorship at UBC specifically on the subject. And my only ask... Of the, of the school was, I wanted a professor who was going to solve for something. I'm tired of being beaten down as a male saying, we're the problem. <laughs> I, actually want, I actually want a solution. And, uh, and so uh, they hired Jennifer Berdahl, who's very solutions based in her work. So, so my, my little contribution, I hope, is that we'll, we'll, we'll tear down the barriers. And, and, and it's important as a leader because you know, we are in a multicultural society. Take a look around this room and see all the different faces that are in here, different sexes, different skin tones, different religions. That is the world. 
and uh, economic barriers are, are lower now than they've ever been. And if we aspire as a nation to uh, compete in Latin America, the United States, Europe, the Middle East, as we are as a business, then you better have people who come from those areas and who know how to speak the language, who are familiar with, with the do's and don'ts of their societies, and, and uh, you're, you're, you have a competitive advantage if you can remove those barriers and make those people your leaders. Um, so that, that's, what, uh, that's why it's important. There's a whole host of other reasons, but those would be the, the big ones. Well, I feel like we could stay here all day and take advice from you. But listen, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, pleasure. Is it over already? Oh, yeah. Can you believe that? Wow. wow that's John Montalbano. I love RBC listening to myself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Is it over already? Yeah. CKNW's Chief Executive Series is presented by Fortis BC, energy solutions for every customer.